Inside the Magic, show number 396 for November 4th, 2012. I am Peter Cullen, the voice of Optimus Prime, and you are listening to Inside the Magic. Obi-Wan Kenobi here, or James Arnold Taylor, or Master Pro Kuhn, or Johnny Test, or any numerous characters, but you're inside the magic. I have a bad feeling about this. R2, light speed to Endor! It is Sunday, November 4th, 2012. This is show 396 of Inside the Magic, and as, uh... Optimus Prime and Obi Wan Kenobi. We're telling you at the top of the show here. It's a it's kind of a big news week here for uh, for theme parks and particularly uh, well a few select topics we'll be talking about uh, later in the show. Kind of a crazy week. Uh, in addition to all of that uh, sort of madness, uh, unexpected and expected, uh, there's plenty of other news to share as well. Another great show packed with plenty of Disney and theme park news and uh, plenty more fun as well. So before we get to all of it, I do invite you to visit our website over at InsideTheMagic.net. There you'll find all of our podcasts, videos, photos, news, articles, and plenty more. And if you ever have any news, tips, questions, comments, anything else you want to send in, uh, you can write to me via email at ricky at InsideTheMagic.net or you can call and leave a message at uh, 407 407- 494-4ITM. That's 4486. And now, let's get on with the show. This week's episode of Inside the Magic is brought to you by Magical Travel. Disney Cruise Line is the top cruise line for families, and you can receive a free shipboard credit when you book your Disney Cruise vacation with Magical Travel. And shipboard credits are good towards merchandise, spa treatments, shore excursions, and plenty more. You can uh, call Magical Travel today at 866-207-8387 or visit them online at MagicalTravel.com to receive a free price quote. And be sure to mention Inside the Magic... Uh, to receive your free Disney gift card for qualifying bookings when you book your Disney vacation with Magical Travel. And uh, thanks very much to uh, listeners and viewers like you for all of your uh, donations, one-time recurring. Uh, And also, worth mentioning here as we enter the holiday season, the Christmas season, I have a link over at InsideTheMagic.net slash Amazon. That is the uh, special page that I have set up year after year where anybody doing some Christmas shopping uh, over on Amazon can click through that link first. And every purchase that you make after clicking through there will support Inside the Magic. So, uh, thanks very much for that and uh and now let's get started with our trip around the world yeah yeah i know what you're thinking oh still with this halloween thing it's past halloween halloween is over and done with well well, yeah you're right halloween this past wednesday uh hopefully everybody had a great time i certainly had a wonderful time uh here at my house had uh, plenty of trick-or-treaters uh show up and i will be posting uh lots of video and photos from my own sort of home haunt if you will uh very very soon it was a great night great response to the new decorations that i had uh uh outside my house this year so hopefully everybody else had a very very happy Happy Halloween as well. For those of you who are like me and still kind of clinging to Halloween just a little bit, you might want to head on over to InsideTheMagic.net where there are a couple of more articles that I have posted just a few days ago for those of you looking for just a little bit more spooky fun. Uh, one of them would be from uh, Universal's Halloween Horror Nights. Look, uh, Lights on look at a number of their uh, haunted houses from this year. In addition, uh, Universal also ran something called Horror Unearthed, which was a really great sort of interactive game in the parks and not most people uh, probably didn't know about throughout the uh, Horror Nights event and on the uh, finale night they surprised fans with a few special things so if you want just a little bit extra Halloween you're going to want to head on over to InsideTheMagic.net to check all of that out so with that uh, over and done and behind us there's something slightly bigger uh, to talk about this week
and everybody knows that fanfare. Uh, pretty obvious music. Uh, it is the famous theme to Star Wars. And normally when I play something like that here on the show, it's because we're talking about, oh, I don't know, Star Tours or Star Wars Weekends or the many other incarnations and partnerships that Disney has had with uh, George Lucas and Lucasfilm and Star Wars in the past. Well, this week... It's just a little bit more than that. In fact, it's a lot more than that. As a completely out of nowhere surprise announcement just a few days ago on Tuesday, Walt Disney CEO Bob Iger announced that the Walt Disney Company was acquiring Lucasfilm. They were purchasing Lucasfilm. The entire company, founded by George Lucas, home to the mega Star Wars franchise and so much more. The purchase price, $4.05 billion. Dollars. That includes the rights to its franchises, its stories, its businesses, Industrial Light and Magic, Skywalker Sound. The list just goes on and on and on. In addition, as if that news wasn't uh, big enough, they also announced more Star Wars films are indeed on the way. They're going to release a seventh Star Wars film in development uh, currently for release in 2015 with a promise of two more after that every two, uh, two to three years or so for Episode Eight and Episode Nine. Uh, in a conference call that followed the big announcement that just lit up the internet and news and everywhere just kind of shocked by this announcement that came out of nowhere. A conference call uh, with Bob Iger and Disney CFO Jay Rizzullo. Uh, it was noted that Episode 7 of Star Wars was in, quote, early stage development right now, end quote. Uh, in addition, Industrial Light and Magic, uh, the company that provides special effects for so many studios out there, so many movies, they are going to continue to offer effects services to other studios, not just Disney, which is good. But, uh, you know, it, it's such a, a monumental announcement that took everybody by surprise. And there's more to it than just movies, of course. Yes, three more Star Wars movies. That's some pretty big news right there. Uh, but in addition, uh, Star Wars television shows are being developed. It seems the Clone Wars uh, is going to move over to uh, a one of Disney's channels, perhaps the Disney Channel, perhaps Disney XD. I'm not sure exactly where that's going to end up. There's live action Star Wars uh, television being worked on. Uh, there is just so much more to think about. Of course, Lucasfilm also includes the rights to uh, the Indiana Jones franchise, though Disney has said so far that they don't really plan on doing much with Indy at the moment. Uh, also includes LucasArts, the video game division. Again, Disney said not going to do too much. They're, they're really, really focusing on Star Wars itself. And in fact, it was Star Wars that they uh, uh, used to uh, come up with the valuation of Lucasfilm, the $4.05 billion. Really, they were focusing on Star Wars itself. And, uh, you know, they, they put out some, some video and some photos of the actual moment when Bob Iger and George Lucas signed that document where Lucas essentially signed away his, well, his life's work. I mean, he is known best for Star Wars, and it is now uh, on its way over to Disney. Such a major, uh, major purchase. Uh, it had apparently been discussed between uh, Lucas and Iger for about a year and a half now, roughly when the uh, the, the new version of Star Tours opened up uh, out here at Walt Disney World about a year and a half ago. So it could be that they very well were out here together for that grand opening and sort of saw the excitement and saw the momentum and decided, hey, we need to make uh, even more out of this, uh, this, uh, this partnership. Uh, George Lucas is going to continue to act as a consultant. He's not disappearing completely, though he is, he is kind of on his way into retirement. Um, Bob Iger said, quote, Disney respects and understands the importance of iconic characters and what it takes to protect and leverage them effectively. And quote, in other words, Disney does not plan on butchering uh, Star Wars in any way, just as they've done with Marvel and Pixar and, and other companies that they have acquired. They plan on leaving it sort of intact. They're not going to split anything up. They're going to keep it rolling and just uh, bring some new leadership to the um, to the whole area. Of course, the next question is, what does this mean for Star Wars in the parks? Of course, as I said, there's already Star Tours, Star Wars Weekends, Jedi Training Academy, plenty of merchandise, lots of crossover characters, and uh, it's unclear at this point what it means. Disney did not announce any specific plans to bring any more Star Wars to the theme parks yet. However, Iger did say on that conference call that there are, quote, ample opportunities, end quote, to include and or expand uh, the uh, the presence of Star Tours in 
the parks. He specifically even noted that Hong Kong Disneyland and the upcoming Shanghai Disneyland would be excellent places for uh, Star Wars to continue in the parks, which could mean that they are working on something there uh, that we don't know about yet. Uh, but of course, everybody would really like to see it out here in, in Orlando and in Florida for uh, Hollywood Studios. That would be nice to expand the Star Wars presence there. Uh, but it is, uh, it, it, the possibilities are just, you know, they're just endless. There's so many options that could be considered for uh, further integrating Star Wars attractions into the theme parks that you could just speculate endlessly. And so until Disney announces anything specifically, it's hard to kind of say uh, where they will be going uh, from here. Now, what I want to share with you now is actually some words straight from uh, Mr. Bob Iger as well as George Lucas. Uh, this is sort of the announcement that, uh, that Disney released from them directly and just hear what they had to say about what it means for Lucasfilm and Star Wars and everything else Lucasfilm to be now uh, owned by Disney. Today, I am proud to announce the Walt Disney Company is acquiring Lucasfilm, the global entertainment company founded by George Lucas and the home of the legendary Star Wars franchise. In addition to getting the rights to one of the greatest family franchises and epic stories of all time, Disney is also acquiring all of Lucasfilm's operating businesses, including Industrial Light and Magic and Skywalker Sound. George Lucas is a true visionary and an innovative epic storyteller who has defined modern filmmaking with unforgettable characters and amazing stories. The Star Wars universe now has more than 17,000 characters inhabiting several thousand planets and spanning 20,000 years. And this gives Disney infinite inspiration and opportunities to continue the epic Star Wars saga. Fans can expect a new feature film, Star Wars Episode Seven, in theaters worldwide in 2015. And there will be more feature films, as well as consumer products, television projects, games, and theme park attractions. We're thrilled that George has entrusted the future of his extraordinary legacy to the Walt Disney Company and recognize what an honor it is. We truly understand the responsibility that comes with being the caretakers of such iconic characters that are beloved by hundreds of millions all over the world. Disney has a unique ability to grow strong brands and expand fantastic creative content as we've proven with our successful acquisitions of both Pixar and Marvel and the addition of Lucasfilm will further our growth strategy and create even more opportunity for Disney to drive significant long-term value for our shareholders. So that was Disney CEO Bob Iger talking about the uh, acquisition of Lucasfilm and Star Wars, obviously. Now let's uh, turn to uh, the man behind it all, George Lucas, for his own thoughts on the deal. I've been a big fan of Disney all my life, uh, you know, from when I was born. Uh, first day at Disneyland, uh, loved Disney movies, uh, got very involved with Disney um, in the uh, 80s and uh, working in the parks, uh, and I've always had a fondness for Disney. Um, at the same time, uh, as I've gone through my career, I realized at some point I needed to retire, and I wanted to go on and do other things. Uh, things in philanthropy and doing more experimental kind of films, but I couldn't really drag my company into that. And uh, I felt it was time for me to uh, start thinking about retiring, and I've been doing that for the last uh, four years. Uh, and one of the most important uh, shifts that I had was I found Kathy Kennedy, who I'd been working with for 40 years, uh, and asked her if she wanted to come and be a co-chairman with me and get ready to take over the company and take over the franchise and do everything. And once that piece was in place, I knew then I could step away and actually retire. Uh, the final block in that would, was to um, find a good, solid home for the company. And um, the first place I thought was uh, Disney. Um, they're large enough, and the match of what our two companies are is just perfect because we're like a mini Disney. We have the same kind of operations. We do the same kind of thing. And I've worked with Disney over the years and I know how they operate. So it was a perfect match of two companies that are uh, constructed similarly, do the same kind of product, 
and um, I think uh, we'll, you know, it'll give me a chance to go off and explore my own interests at the same time feel completely confident that Disney, uh, you know, will take good care of the franchise I've built and um, at the same time, you know, for me, I look at it as uh, uh, I'm investing in Disney because that's my retirement fund. The future Star Wars films, uh, Kathy and I have been working on future Star Wars films and uh, the main reason I brought Kathy on is rather than quit, I wanted to have it move forward but I needed somebody I trusted who could take that franchise and make it work the way I intended it to. So once Kathy came on board, we started working with writers and started working uh, on all the processes of doing the films. Um, so we've you know got a plan for uh, seven, eight, and nine, which are the, is the, the end of the trilogy, and um, other films also. So uh, we have a, you know, a large uh, uh, group of ideas and characters and books and all kinds of things. We could go on making Star Wars for the next hundred years. So there's George Lucas in his own words as to why he decided to uh, sell off his company for uh, that he's been working on for so many years, wanting to find the right home for it and uh, how to continue uh, with the franchises moving forward. And you, you notice he not only mentioned Star Wars Episode 7, 8, and 9 to round out that third trilogy that he's been thinking about for so many years. I mean, that's been part of his plan for a long time. Uh, but in addition, he mentioned other films. And Iger was very careful to say they plan on releasing Star Wars films every two to three three years, not even necessarily limiting themselves to seven, eight, and nine, but there could be more out of this universe uh, even beyond that. So there's a lot more Star Wars to come under the Disney brand, under the Disney name. It'll be a little odd to go to the theater and not see 20th Century Fox attached to a, 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 a Star Wars film instead of the uh, Disney logo, uh, but it'll it'll certainly be interesting. The uh, most, uh, uh, well, maybe not surprising, but uh, certainly worth noting footnote to all of this, uh, George Lucas has said he plans on taking that $4.05 billion, which essentially is all his. Uh, it's He is the sole shareholder of, of or was the sole shareholder shareholder of Lucasfilm has now become Disney's second largest single shareholder as a result of the deal and he's essentially taking that for roughly four billion dollars and he's not just uh, you know pocketing it and, and I mean how do you live off of four billion dollars I'm sure he's already got uh, you know a crazy amount of money so he's planning on actually donating a large percentage of that uh, to charity to uh, to education uh, going forward so his uh, as, as one article I saw put it in a headline that uh, George Lucas has created the ultimate estate plan for him here you know it's when you've got that amount of money and that amount of property and, and so many things going on you want to make sure that it's planned for for the future you can't just dump something like this on somebody on your heirs perhaps and uh, and and you know be um you know, have somebody else be stuck with it, uh, quote unquote. So, uh, very interesting that Disney's uh, paying such a large amount of money for this, and then it's it's essentially going to charity, which is a nice thing. Uh, so, what does it mean? You know, Star Wars in the parks, TV, movies, merchandise. Uh, it means all of that. It means any of that. It means uh, we will have to wait and see uh, just uh, what will become of this deal in the future. It's certainly exciting to say the least. Uh, and, and of course, what does it mean for Inside the Magic? How much Star Wars news am I going to now cover uh, based on this? Uh, Star Wars is now Disney, as uh, are many other arms of the uh, Lucasfilm uh, organization. And I'll just have to kind of pick and choose whatever's the most major news. Don't worry, I'm not going to turn this into the Star Wars podcast every week or anything. But, you know, now that it's all part of it, there's certainly, uh, just as I've been talking about Marvel here and there, I will have to do the same for uh, for a bit of Star Wars as well. So here is uh, here's a question that came in related to all of this from uh, listener Fernando. Hey Ricky, this is Fernando calling from Tampa. I just wanted to comment on the recent purchase of Lucasfilm by Disney. I was watching the the, um, the video you posted on your on your blog post, and it mentioned theme parks in there by Bob Iger. Do you think, by any chance, that because of the recent creative differences? between James Cameron and Disney, that maybe that project has gone aside and maybe Star Wars can step in to take the spot of the possible Avatar land. It's just a thought that popped in my head. Well, thanks so much, and uh, keep up the good work. 
Definitely a great question to be asking now because, of course, everybody has been focused on uh, this notion of Avatar coming to Disney's Animal Kingdom, working with James Cameron, bringing this, you know, Pandora, the land of Avatar, and multiple attractions. We even recently talked about sort of, uh, quote-unquote, leaked plans for uh, various attractions there. Uh, but Star Wars, clearly a much, much bigger deal, a much bigger announcement than Avatar ever was. In fact, when the Avatar news hit from that moment, which has been, uh, I don't know, a year-ish, maybe a little bit more than a year now, uh, since since that happened uh, until now, uh, just uh, to gauge sort of the interest level here, our article over on InsideTheMagic.net, the little like button that we have on all of our posts uh, where you can like it on Facebook, that from that point all the way until this week had about uh, a thousand and a half likes on it, which is a pretty good amount. That was the most liked article ever over on the website. That is, until Star Wars hit this week, the Star Wars article this week got almost 5,000 likes on it. And, uh, you know, the metrics, it doesn't really matter the number itself. Uh, the What matters is the sort of multiplier there, the amount of times over that Star Wars got versus Avatar. And I remember, uh, you know, when Avatar was first announced, everybody was like, can we have Star Wars instead? So uh, certainly interesting there. So, uh, you know, we're going to leave it at that. That's uh, uh, about 20 minutes or so of talking about nothing but Star Wars here. There's certainly plenty more to elaborate on, and uh, actually a little bit later in the show, we're going to have a little bit more conversation about that. However, if you do want to find out more about the deal, you want to hear more, uh, you want to hear the full conference call with uh, Bob Iger and Jay Rizzullo, you want to see a uh, video of them signing the contract, and uh, even more, head on over to InsideTheMagic.net and check our YouTube channel for, uh, for even more of uh, what very well may have been uh, the biggest announcement to come out of Disney in, in many, many, many years. So uh, we mentioned a charity just a minute ago, and I wanted to uh, sort of uh, come off of that, where uh, this week, of course, uh, Hurricane Sandy had uh, also descended upon the uh, Northeast, became Superstorm Sandy, as many had been calling it a terrible thing. And uh, Disney, uh, fortunately, has uh, stepped in as well for uh, a charitable uh, contribution there. Uh, $2 million is what Disney is contributing to relief and rebuilding efforts this week for those uh, impacted by Hurricane Sandy. Bob Iger said, quote, it's hard to fathom the other devastation from this storm. Uh, thousands of people in the hurricane's path lost everything and faced the daunting challenge of putting their lives and communities back together. We hope this helps provide immediate aid needed to get through this disaster and begin the road to recovery. End quote. So uh, hopefully uh, any of our uh, Inside the Magic audience out there, hopefully everybody's doing very, very well. Uh, I have not heard of uh, anybody in particular that is in uh, any terrible hardships uh, directly related to the show, which is fantastic. I, I love to, uh, to hear that. Uh, but certainly we're thinking about about anybody who's uh, had some hard times with the storm. Certainly, uh, I know all about it. Living down here in uh, in Florida, I am well aware of what these types of storms can do. So, moving on uh, from there, uh, between uh, a hurricane and Star Wars announcement, you wouldn't think there'd be too much more, uh, too much larger um, uh, news happening this week. But uh, over at Universal Orlando, uh, of course, here in Orlando, in Florida, there was indeed some other big news. Uh, uh, to be had. Uh, there was an announcement planned for this past Thursday, which ended up being two days after Disney's big Star Wars announcement, and that's right, the robots are no longer in disguise at Universal Orlando. They have finally announced the long-rumored Transformers The Ride 3D. It's going to debut uh, just in time for summer 2013. That's next summer. Pretty much been under construction 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They are fast-tracking this project. Uh, it's unbelievable the speed at which they are uh, uh, creating this uh, very high-tech, very immersive, uh, very fun ride. The announcement itself was held at Universal Orlando around their central lagoon at night. Uh, they interrupted their cinematic spectacular Lagoon show with a special uh, sort of transmission from Optimus Prime and Megatron and uh, uh, to announce that Transformers The Ride 3D indeed would be coming to uh, Orlando. There were uh, construction workers from the site uh, watching the show. They, they paused for a little while so that, uh, you know, I'm sure they're happy they can finally talk about the project that they've been working on since, uh, since about June is when they've started construction on this. And uh, it's going in the former location 
location of Soundstage 44 in uh, Universal Studios, Florida. That's the former home of uh, the Murder, She Wrote show, as well as Hercules, Hercules and Xena. Uh, and it's been uh, kind of dormant for a number of years now. The ride itself, uh, certainly talked about it here on the show before. It's uh, it's going to be identical to the one in Hollywood and in Singapore. And, uh, you know, back in May when it opened in Hollywood, it talked extensively here. It's very similar to Spider-Man, uh, The Amazing Adventures of Spider-Man, though with bigger screens, more immersive 3D, and definitely an exciting uh, attraction that I love very much and can't wait for it to come out here. As part of the announcement, in addition, in front of the Universal Orlando Globe, Optimus Prime and Bumblebee made an appearance uh, walking around and posing for pictures, and they will be available for uh, for meet and greets, uh, presumably, when the ride uh, opens next year. Uh, the Transformers attraction first opened at Universal Studios Singapore in December of 2011, then it followed in uh, Hollywood in May of, uh, of this year, of 2012. And uh, the only difference really between... Um you know, this version and uh, the other versions will be uh, the biggest difference, I should say, will be the building itself is going to look different, but on the inside, the ride is going to be largely the same. Uh, there was no mention of, uh, of Harry Potter during this announcement. Of course, we know uh, uh, an expansion of uh, the Wizarding World of Harry Potter is on the way over there, but uh, the Dis- uh, or rather Universal has not confirmed any of the details, certainly no mention of the Jaws, uh, former Jaws uh, area construction site. However, there was a press conference following the announcement. Uh, with uh, Terry Coop, uh, Koo and uh, Mark Woodbury, uh, both of Universal Creative. Uh, and I have posted that full press conference over on our YouTube channel if you're interested in um, and hearing more about what Transformers The Ride uh, 3D will be bringing to Orlando and, um, and and some additional details there. But right now I actually want to share a few details. Uh, Terry Coop is the uh, Senior Vice President of, of Universal Creative and he's also the uh, Executive Creative Director for Transformers The Ride 3D. And uh, following the press conference I actually had a chance to uh, chat a little bit one-on-one with him and get some of my own questions answered. So let's uh, go out in front of the uh, Universal Orlando Globe with uh, Optimus Prime and Bumblebee in the background. Uh, certainly an interesting interview uh, area for that and hear a bit about what this ride will be bringing to Orlando. Transformers the Ride 3D coming to Orlando. Very exciting. I enjoyed the ride very much in Hollywood. Uh, I'm thrilled to have it out here. Uh, what was the decision to sort of duplicate it and bring it out here now as opposed to making people go to California or Singapore for it? Well, this ride is so extremely popular. Yes, in Singapore, in Hollywood, uh, we thought, why not bring it to Orlando? And we have, we have our guests that come to our parks in Orlando and it, it, it just was a natural thing for us. It's such a perfect fit for Universal Orlando. And uh, like I said, it's, it just, it was meant to be. We have a spot, perfect spot in the center of the park here. And, uh, and we wanted all our guests here on the East Coast to enjoy this attraction as much as it's enjoyed all over the world right now. I think it was a big surprise to everybody when that soundstage suddenly just disappeared one day and everyone was like, what's going on? Of course, lots of rumors swirling. Uh, was it tough to keep the secret this long since June or so when that came down? Uh, a lot of speculations went on, you know, but of course, it's such a fast moving, you know, the building right. that was soundstage before went down in about a week, I think, and the building that's currently going up for Transformers is, is going up so fast. This is the most ambitious project we've ever done. I mean, uh, a year, one year turnaround, typically it's uh, two to three years for an attraction of this complexity, but fortunately we've done it twice before and we have the same team on this one, so we're super excited to be able to bring this to life in, by next summer. Well, that was going to be my next question. So you do you build it in Singapore. I imagine that was a challenge initially. Then Hollywood, yeah, a little bit easier. Now you're in Orlando. It's essentially the same ride, right? It is the same ride. It's same, the same ride experience, the same storyline, characters. There are some slight differences to the, uh, the architecture of the building on the exterior. And then the pre-show experience, slightly different layout, but exactly the same story. Excellent. And of course, we're standing with uh, Optimus Prime and Bumblebee here behind you. Are guests going to have a chance to meet them here at Universal Orlando? Well, I'd say why not? I mean, they're so popular. Again, in Singapore, we have them as well. And in Hollywood, I mean, they're so cool when you look at them and when they start interacting with some of the guests. So why not? One last question for you. Uh, Transformers the ride, lots of big screens, lots of big action. Do you think that's kind of the future of theme park technology is this immersive 3D environment or is there still place for practical just depending on the type of, uh, of you know material that you're working with? I completely think there's a place for practical and uh, animated figures and there's just a different type of experience and uh, we certainly look forward to the future in developing some of those attractions as well. Great, can't wait to see it. Thank you very much. Welcome, it's a pleasure.
So that was the executive creative director for Transformers The Ride 3D, Terry Koo, and uh, always a nice guy. I've had a chance to talk to him a few times over the years, and uh, he's definitely very much involved in this sort of virtual ride uh, experience like Spider-Man and uh, Transformers and even Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey, though that one is in 3D. It still has a lot of screens in it, uh, so interesting uh, to sort of follow his direction of theme park design, theme park attraction design versus uh, the more sort of practical side of things. Uh, I did uh, ask the question during the press conference is, you know, why are there not giant Transformers animatronics in this attraction? And they said uh, basically a 30 to 40 foot tall Transformer uh, a robot, a real life animatronic robot simply would not uh, simply would not work uh, as well as they need it to be, that it would uh, it would just not move as quickly and as fluidly and as, uh, you know, I guess reliably as uh, perhaps the uh, 3D visuals uh, on life size visuals that they have in the ride. Uh, and I can see where that's true. If you think about uh, good old Yeti over at uh, Expedition Everest and the share of problems uh, Disney has had with that large scale uh, animatronic figure. And that's not even nearly as big as something like Optimus Prime would be. So uh, certainly, uh, you know, one of those calls they have to make to, uh, you know, just to decide what's reliable versus what is real and cool. And, uh, you know, the 3D visuals and Transformers are pretty darn impressive. Uh, anyway, to, uh, to wrap this up, I just feel like I need to share one more thing here about Transformers that was particularly amusing. Uh, following the announcement the next day after all the, the press event and everything, uh, I, received the, I received the following phone call uh, on my cell phone. I am Optimus Prime. You are in grave danger. I must warn you that the Decepticons are mobilizing to take over Universal Orlando. We need your help to defeat Megatron and defend mankind before it is too late. The time has come to prepare for battle. Yeah, so I got I got a phone call from Optimus Prime. I mean, that's that's pretty cool. So kudos to uh, to Universal for continuing. They did that with the Halloween Horror Nights uh, a few weeks ago, and sort of had uh, had uh, phone calls coming in uh, out to you know whatever numbers they had on file for media numbers, and and I mean you know how is how can I not be happy about. Uh, about getting a call from Optimus Prime. That's just that's just amazing. So anyway, uh, there it is. Uh, Transformers The Ride 3D, uh, summer 2013 at Universal Orlando. Of course, it's already open in uh, Universal in Singapore as well as in Hollywood. And you can head on over to the website and see uh, plenty more of the, the ride itself and interviews and press conferences and all that good stuff. So now, uh, on top of those major announcements this week, there was uh, a pretty good, fair amount of other theme park news to talk about here. And uh, let's see. First up, we will talk about uh, New Fantasyland over at the Magic Kingdom. Of course, uh, previews continued there. This weekend began uh, annual pass holder previews of, uh, of New Fantasyland. Uh, and uh, I was confirmed just a few days ago, in fact, for sort of the second round of New Fantasyland annual pass holder previews in this sort of sweet stakes that I talked about, uh, I think, last week or the week before anyway. So I will be there uh, November 13th uh, till 1 a.m., late night preview. Sounds like fun. I think I will, uh, I have not been over to New Fantasyland yet to, to see it at night, so that should be uh, should be fun to see it all lit up and, uh, and looking good. Uh, also continuing with uh, New Fantasyland just a couple of days ago, the Disney Parks blog put out a quick message uh, on the blog and on Twitter saying, uh, quick sign up for a Be Our Guest meetup. And uh, it filled up very, very quickly. Within just a few minutes, they had said, up, oh, we're, we're completely full. Turned out there were about 98 names that I, uh, they, they released the list of everybody who was attending. 98 names were selected to uh, be part of this meetup that will take place on November uh, 17th. Each uh, attendee, each uh, registered uh, person will be able to bring one guest, so 196 people total. Relatively small group for a meetup, and that's because the meetup is going to be inside the Be Our Guest restaurant. They're going to give everybody dinner there, a full meal. There's going to be a special photo op. Uh, there's going to be Imagineer-led tours around the uh, the whole restaurant and a few other surprises because Disney Parks Blog always likes to add surprises to these meetups. And uh, yes, fortunately, I did act quickly enough to get my name on that list, so I will certainly be there for that meetup. Uh, if anyone else out there got in, definitely say hi to me when we're uh, dining and walking around and should be a... Uh, uh, a good time. 
Speaking of Be Our Guest, uh, though, uh, the reservations that everybody was clamoring for uh, back in August uh, don't start until November 19th for dinner service. They've actually been serving lunch and dinner at Be Our Guest uh, this week. They just started a few days ago, and, uh, you know, it's not guaranteed it's going to be open. It's not definitely going to be for lunch, not definitely going to be for dinner, not definitely going to be open at all. It is still very much a test preview phase, and as such, I have opted not to go over to uh, Be Our Guest and dine there yet because I really don't want my first impression of eating in this fantastic new restaurant to be eh, you know the service had problem or the, this food wasn't good or it is a test phase right now and disney is working out the kinks of uh of what is a rather elaborate service there uh certainly a very unique menu to the magic kingdom so i'm gonna wait a little while i'm gonna wait for them to work out those uh those bugs those kinks and uh and then i will be happy to dine at uh, be our guest when it's in its full glory and then i will certainly talk all about it then but uh, if you're really clamoring for some early reviews there's many other sites out there that have already uh, rushed out and uh, you know I've seen I, people say well the food wasn't so good or this wasn't you know this is good this is not good and you know it's um, not something that I want to really participate in but uh, they're out there so if you want to read those early reviews go search online and you'll you'll find it all right, let's uh, hop over to Epcot now, where some changes uh, are noticeably going on at Test Track. That is, the new uh, entrance area has been uh, showing up. First, Disney released some concept art online of what it would look like, and now a big new sort of double T marquee has gone up outside Test Track. It officially opens on December 6th, though uh, testing has already begun uh, of the cars going around the track. They've been heard whooshing around lately. Uh, no soft openings yet. Nobody knows if there are going to be soft openings or maybe it's just going to open on December 6th, maybe a couple days before, who knows. But the color scheme of Test Track is now kind of blue. Uh, Disney likes to call it sleek. It's not uh, yellow and black anymore. And uh, on the new entrance area that's very uh, sort of high-tech looking, uh, there is even a hidden tribute to World of Motion. There's a tiny little World of Motion symbol hidden amongst the uh, the new banner outside Test Track, which is a nice touch. Uh, I kind of like the way it looks. I, the old look, the the sort of test facility look of the, the checkered, yellow and black look that got kind of old in my opinion so definitely looking forward to seeing how this sort of uh, high tech futuristic computerized version looks throughout uh, the building when it uh, opens up in a few weeks and uh, yes, uh, Halloween season is indeed over, and that means that uh, Christmas season is upon us. It's uh, starting uh, very, very soon. Just five days from now will be the first Mickey's Very Merry Christmas Party over at the Magic Kingdom. Christmas festivities are happening out at Disneyland as well and all over Walt Disney World. Uh, in fact, opening night of Mickey's Very Merry Christmas Party actually is sold out. So clearly there is a lot of interest for Christmas, even this early, uh, even before Thanksgiving. I was very excited to read the other day that Scrooge McDuck apparently will be returning for his meet and greet at, uh, during Mickey's Very Merry Christmas Party. He was gone last year uh, just because of New Fantasyland construction. So with a lot of that winding down uh, now, it seems like Scrooge is going to be back, and I'm excited about that. Uh, over at Disney's Hollywood Studios, the Osborne Family Spectacle of Dancing Lights, of course, will be returning. They recently completed a conversion to uh, energy-efficient LEDs. They've integrated some uh, bits from the prep and landing television specials. Well, this year, the new addition for the uh, uh, the Osborne family spectacle of dancing lights will be Santa Goofy. He's going to be appearing nightly in the streets of America in Goofy's Winter Wonderland. So you'll have a chance to meet good old Goofy dressed as uh, Santa during that event. In addition, during the event, an eighth song uh, for the Dancing Lights has been added. It's Winter Wonderland in an arrangement uh, created by Creative Entertainment Music Director Dan Stamper. That will also be debuting November 9th, and it will continue every day at Hollywood Studios through January 6th. Let's jump coasts out to California, where this year, uh, of course, this will be the first Christmas for Buena Vista Street and the first Christmas for Cars Land, and both will be decked out for the holidays. This week, Disney released some concept art of what Buena Vista Street is going to look like at uh, Disney California Adventure Park for Christmas time. It's going to include Santa Claus appearing inside the Elias and Company department store, which is a brilliant idea, having a department store Santa, of course, on Buena Vista Street. I love it. Uh, Buena Vista Street community bell ringers will be out in about having some sing-alongs that are ring-alongs, as Disney put it. And the uh, Carthay Circle will be home to a giant Christmas tree, and each night will be the lighting of that tree. That begins uh, November 12th and will continue through January 6th. 
speaking of Carthay Circle, here's something I'm really excited about that's coming out just a couple of days from now. A new CD that everybody has been asking for is indeed going to be released. The Circle Sessions, the music of Carthay Circle. It's jazz renditions of great Disney songs. The soundtrack uh, to the Carthay Circle Restaurant and Lounge. The track list is, uh, let's see, there are 12 tracks. I'll run through them real quick. A Dream is a Wish Your Heart Makes. Be Our Guest. Everybody Wants to Be a Cat. Winnie the Pooh, A Whole New World. Alice in Wonderland, He's a Tramp. Can You Feel the Love Tonight? If I didn't have you, married life, someday my prince will come and you've got a friend in me. It will be for sale in the uh, Carthay Circle Restaurant and Lounge uh, on Buena Vista Street, as well as nearby locations like Elias and Company and Off the Page. And I absolutely will have to get my hands on that CD. I love the music of Cars Land CD that they put out. So uh, I definitely can't wait to grab that one as well. A little bit more Christmas news. Uh, this weekend was the taping of the annual Christmas Day Parade uh, out at Disneyland. Mario Lopez is the host this year for the Disneyland portion. Musical guests include the Backstreet Boys and some other Disney Channel stuff. And uh, so that will be aired, of course, on Christmas Day in conjunction with the footage that they will shoot out here at Walt Disney World. Apparently, Nick Cannon is going to be the host for the Walt Disney World portion this year. And uh, I've read that they're going to tape that in the Magic Kingdom December 1st and 2nd. I'm not 100% on that. Um, could be a day before or after that, so don't hold me to it, but uh, that is at least what I read. Uh, and uh, whenever that happens, it's always a very busy couple of days in the Magic Kingdom. Some other exciting news that uh, happened this week, uh, also involving Mario Lopez out at uh, Disneyland, was the grand opening of Earl of Sandwich at Downtown Disney, the first Earl of Sandwich location, I believe, in California, which is, uh, you know, if you haven't been out there yet and you're local and you haven't grabbed that holiday sandwich, go do it immediately. That thing is delicious. Earl of Sandwich is located over sort of near ESPN Zone in the movie theater and kind of in that general area. And, uh, of course, it's been open out here at Walt Disney World for quite a long time, and now... Those of you who are in Anaheim can enjoy the Earl sandwiches as well. Online uh, news now. Disney this week started up a new Tumblr page at DisneyParksPhotoProject.tumblr.com. And this is a particularly unique project that they've started. They reached out to some uh, essentially Disney Park fans that are excellent photographers and decided to gather their photography together into one Tumblr blog, which is a wonderful idea. Uh, I didn't recognize uh, most of the names on there. However, there was one in particular that is uh, he's uh, you know a friend and somebody who I have seen uh, many times at many Disney events. He's always around taking pictures of everything. His name is Tom Bricker. You might know him as well from the, uh, I think, the Disney photo blog, appropriately named, uh, and he does some awesome photos. So go check that out. Uh, check out his photos and everybody else there. They all have shot some amazing pictures in the parks. Here's a special D23 event that is coming up. Uh, it's a new Fantasyland preview day, but it's not out here in Florida. It's actually taking place at Walt Disney Imagineering headquarters in Glendale, California on November 10th. Just six days from now, you'll be able to uh, chat with Imagineers like Chris Beatty and others who are instrumental in the creation of new Fantasyland. Also, there'll be pin trading and the ability to buy stuff from Mickey's of Glendale and all that good stuff. So anyone who's a D23 member can simply show up. It is first come, first serve, so you might end up waiting in a very long line to get in there. Uh, but uh, if you head on over to the D23 website, you can find out uh, all the details there. Now let's turn to the movies where uh, Wreck-It Ralph debuted this weekend and has done phenomenally at the box office. In fact, it's a record breaker. $49.1 million is what uh, the estimated take is for the weekend, and that is the top weekend debut ever for a Disney Animation Studios title. Very impressive. It even topped Tangled which uh, had been released over a Thanksgiving holiday weekend. That one brought in $48.8 million. So Wreck-It Ralph, huge, huge movie. I certainly enjoyed it. Talked about it here on the show a couple of weeks ago. Just posted my review on InsideTheMagic.net a couple of days ago as well, if you haven't had a chance to see it, as well as uh, Paper Man, the excellent short that went along with it. Definitely rush out and see them together. Uh, it even looks great in 3D. Uh, just uh, definitely a great movie, and, and hopefully it will continue to be very, very successful throughout out to the month of uh, November and well into the Thanksgiving and the Christmas season. 
Related to Wreck-It Ralph, uh, something rather amusing uh, was supposed to take place this week. If you're familiar with The King of Kong, uh, it was a documentary about sort of this battle between two guys wanting to be the world champion of, di of uh, Donkey Kong, and uh, the guys' names are Billy Mitchell and Steve Wiebe, and apparently they were going to battle it out over Fix-It Felix Jr., the uh, sort of retro arcade game created a very similar style as Donkey Kong, created for Wreck-It Ralph. Uh, Billy Mitchell was going to play it in uh, Miami, whereas uh, Weeby was going to play it in Seattle. And uh, unfortunately, while that was supposed to take place this past Thursday, one of the two arcade machines had a bit of a glitch. So they were not able to uh, fully uh, uh, go head to head and uh, fulfill that competition, but they've postponed it for a few days. It's apparently going to happen again this week, so it'll be interesting to see uh, who is the winner of that. Continuing with some movie news here, uh, Inside the Magic listener James wrote to me with a link to some photos that are uh, wonderful to see. A first look of uh, Emma Thompson playing P.L. Travers, author of uh, Mary Poppins, for the upcoming film Saving Mr. Banks. Uh, they shot this past week at uh, Grumman's Chinese Theater, sort of reenacting the world premiere of Mary Poppins. And there was a retro-style Snow White there, and uh, lurking somewhere there was Tom Hanks playing Walt Disney, though I haven't seen any photos of him in action there yet. Uh, so thanks to uh, James from orlandovacationtips.blogspot.co.uk for sending over that link. And uh, supposedly, uh, Saving Mr. Banks will be shooting this coming week, just a few days from now, at uh, Disneyland, uh, right around the carousel from what I understand. So if you're going to be at Disneyland this week, keep an eye out. Uh, definitely will be a historic moment when Walt, uh, well, when Tom Hanks steps into the park as Walt Disney. Turning to the world of television, now here's a rumor that is going around that ABC's 90s sitcom Boy Meets World, very popular show, apparently, uh, potentially, will be getting a sequel on the Disney Channel, perhaps Girl Meets World. Uh, they're working on, uh, in very early stages, uh, trying to recast the original actors from the uh, from the original show, Ben Savage and Daniel Fischel, who played Corey and Topanga, and uh, they want to recast them uh, in their own original characters, but now as adults, with a sort of preteen daughter, and she'll be the uh, the new girl star of the film. That should be interesting if that pans out. And final uh, thing that I want to mention here, not really related to any of that news, uh, but the uh, podcast awards are uh, once again going on. The nominees are up for 2012, and if you've uh, seen those, you might be wondering, well, where the heck is Inside the Magic? We've been nominated for year after year after year after year. Well, guess what? We were not allowed to be nominated this year because, well, apparently uh, winning Best Produced last year ended up being a bad thing because for some reason that prevented us from being nominated in any category this year. Didn't know about the rules don't really understand the rule. Uh, there have been others who have run into the same problem apparently over the years, and then they kind of just gave up on the podcast awards after that because the rule just seems kind of arbitrary uh, and, and inconsistent because it's not it's only true for Best Produced and uh, People's Choice for some reason, not the other categories. I don't know. I don't understand it. So we're not pod, uh, part of the podcast awards this year, uh, not by choice, but uh, by rule. But, uh, you know, moving forward, I may just sort of bow out of the whole thing altogether. It's really just a podcast awards really just run by one guy. Uh, um, I, I would love to see somebody develop a podcast award sort of with judges or a, like a like an academy, you know, somebody, a professional sort of voting and that kind of thing. Right now, it's just kind of popularity contest, but uh, but it's still cool. Anyway, if you've got uh, a favorite show out there and they are nominated, you know, head out, vote for them. But uh, you won't find us on the list this year. So uh, anyway, that is it for your news from around the world this week. This week's tip as we uh, get to the Christmas season comes in from Doug from Utah, who writes, as the holidays approach, here is something that my family and I have found to really spruce up the Christmas tree without breaking the bank. As you know, Christmas ornaments at the Disney parks can sometimes be very pricey. However, we've found a pretty inexpensive alternative. 
keychains. They are perfect for hanging, and you can find just uh, as much variety as any ornament. They may not be as big, but for the price of one ornament, you can usually find several keychains, and so you're going to get more bang for your buck. Plus, they aren't as fragile, and you don't have to worry about them uh, breaking on your travels back home. Uh, Doug, I love that idea because uh, Disney's keychains are rather elaborate. They're kind of the best of what Disney pins are, uh, but usually a little bit larger. They're metal. They're certainly resilient, uh, durable, and uh, usually pretty shiny and flashy and, and could make some pretty good Christmas ornaments. I had never thought of that, but uh, I love that tip, and I may have to go buy some, uh, some keychains and hang them on the tree. Uh, everybody else out there, email your tips into tips at InsideTheMagic.net. And now after uh, almost 50 minutes of me talking solid, it's time to give my voice a little bit of a break here for an Inside the Magic dance break. This dance break is brought to you by the number one dance game brand, Just Dance, which has met the magical world of Disney in the newest and coolest video game for the whole family called Just Dance Disney Party, in which you can dance to songs from some of your favorite beloved Disney classic movies like The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Jungle Book, and Cinderella. Plus, you can dance along to songs from Disney Channel shows like Shake It Up, Ant Farm, Jesse and Phineas, and Ferb. It is perfect for kids of all ages. Just Dance Disney Party is a great way to keep the family active, and it is now available available at major retailers uh, for both Kinect for Xbox 360 and for the N Nintendo Wii. So pick up your copy today. So those of you who have been paying attention to Inside the Magic for the last couple of weeks have heard me talk about this sort of strange haunted mansion ghost story thing that's been going on. Uh, you know, it wasn't really clear as to where it was going to go. I had a cast member email me and uh, say, uh, you know, after I had asked, oh, has anyone seen real ghosts in the haunted mansion? And uh, this cast member emailed me and said, yeah, I have proof essentially i was like okay yeah right whatever uh long story short uh, finally on last week's show of course i said uh you know this coming week i was going to finally be able to post that video and indeed that did happen uh it's over on inside the magic.net and if you haven't seen this kind of crazy spooky uh, uh haunted mansion ghost video go over to inside the magic.net right now and, uh, and look at it, because I'm about to talk a little bit more about it, and I don't want to sort of spoil anything about it for you. So I'll give you a few seconds, shut off the podcast, go do, you know, go over to the website, and uh, yeah, so go do that before listening to this upcoming segment. Okay, assuming that everybody uh, continuing to tune in here has already seen the video you know that it is uh, it is more than just a ghost story. It is not exactly what I had billed it as. It is actually a short film called Missing in the Mansion. And this week I am bringing on the writers and the directors of that short film. Uh, no strangers to Inside the Magic. It is the Dawes brothers, uh, Josh and Jeremiah. Uh, fantastic idea for this short. I had a, a small part in working on it, but this is really your baby. Thanks very much for uh, coming on the show. And let's let's talk about this thing a little bit. Thanks for having us, Ricky. Yeah, so, so uh, how long ago what, did you get an idea to set a short film at Disneyland and, in, and related to the Haunted Mansion? It wasn't that long ago. Yeah. Um, sometime this summer. Yeah, it was in, I think in July, July was when we first started thinking of it. And we knew we okay. had a short turnaround, so we, we hit the ground running. <laughs> right, yeah. so because you wanted to get it out by Halloween. Yeah, right. and we knew they, they shut down the, the mansion for the overlay. Uh, right, right, of course. September, so we had to get going. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. So so Missing in the Mansion is the title of it. And it's basically, uh, you know, many people have said, oh, it's like Blair Witch Project or Paranormal Activity or, you know, it's sort of this found footage concept of uh, uh, basically set in Disneyland where you're following a, a group of characters who are sort of telling their own little ghost story, much as we have been for the last couple of weeks. And you follow them through some spooky stuff. What was the inspiration to sort of inject some real scares into the mansion? Well, we, we really wanted to do something based on a, on a Disney attraction. And then the, this whole found footage idea came to us somehow. And we just thought, you know, it, we, love the, we love the Nightmare Before Christmas overlay, but it's, mm -hmm. it's always disappointing at Halloween time that you can't ride the actual mansion because it is right. so, it's, it's scarier and spookier. And so we just started thinking, what could we do? with the mansion to make it scary again at Halloween time. And it's kind of came up with this. Yeah. Now, what's, what's interesting about this is you start watching it, and of course it's this sort of found footage concept, so it looks, for the first half of it, like you're just watching somebody's home video, basically, and you're just like, oh, this is silly, what is going on? And then as you get into it, of course, it draws you into the story, and then it really hits you with the, the creepy, scary, you know, over-the-topness, and then, of course, the grand finale uh, is, is a familiar face to uh, anybody who's been a Mansion fan over the years. You want to talk a little bit about that? Of course, hopefully everybody listening out there has already seen it. I don't want to spoil anything, but uh, assuming that, go ahead. Yeah, we, we just, you know, after, after developing the story with uh, one of our producers, um, we just, we came to the point where, you know, the icing on the cake for this short, you know, had to be the Hatbox Ghost. We had to have him in there. Um, yes. And, and, you know, because we knew the fans, it would just, it would just mean the world to the fans, to us, you know, to actually see a fully realized Hatbox ghost, you know, walking and talking and uh, in the ride, in the ride, especially. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, of course, the Hatbox ghost part of Haunted Mansion lore for, for decades now, because he was in the ride very, very briefly. And then, uh, and then that's it. And nobody has really seen him since other than, of course, merchandise and t-shirts and, you know, right. things like that. And to see him now, uh, well, I would say live, but he's not really live he's dead but whatever he is he's in the mansion and he appears and and it just looked i mean you you looked like you did a lot of work to bring the hatbox ghost to life yeah it was uh well it was it was a combination of a lot of things i mean it was it was we had had an actor our, our friend jason levisey um portrayed the hatbox ghost and he's a taller skinnier guy so we definitely could uh could we knew he could do the physicality of the performance and then we uh, it was a combination of makeup and contact lenses and um, and then the costume. Uh, yeah, the costume really sold it. it there's a, a place out here in, uh, in Hollywood called uh, Western Costume Company. It's just this huge warehouse. Like, it's two or three warehouses back to back of just all kinds of costumes they've been collecting since I think, 1908. Yeah, it's like over 100 years. It's and... crazy. But uh, yeah, we just found this we're able to piece together this amazing costume that just really brought the whole thing together. Yeah. And that hat was, you know, iconic. <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely. And, and the, the box, of course, and the cane, and just everything about it definitely looks, uh, it looks spot on. I mean, it looks exactly like the hat box ghost uh, uh, should be. And, and it's, it's, you know, this is, this is kind of the message that's a little bit hard to get across when it comes to the internet that, uh, you know, you've got this video, it's up on YouTube and people, you know, can just kind of think, oh, it's just some stupid internet video, but this is like a legit short film. I mean, you've been putting weeks and weeks of long, you know, <laughs> overnights and, and money and time and multiple, you know, I had a whole crew of people. And right. I mean, this is no, this is no joke. No, we, we, yeah. <laughs> you know, on top of our, our day jobs, we've been, you know, every night, every morning, you know, uh, I mean, it started out, we, we were writing it, um, and then we shot, and then we spent probably a month editing, and then, uh, and then special effects, special effects, yeah. just, and they were kicking our butt there for a while. It was, <laughs> it was a long, intense, um, because we had two visual effects artists that were, you know, doing it in their spare time, helping us out, and uh, and then right up until the, the moment we were pressed, you know, upload to YouTube, we were adjusting the right. uh, Ghost nose. That was the that was the thing that just took forever. 
Right. Well, and that's such a small detail too. And that's what you'll hear for any. I, you know, you watch these behind the scenes making of uh, things on DVDs, and it's uh, you always hear like, oh, uh, we had a, you know, hit the theaters on the twenty second of the month, and we were, uh, you know, editing things until the twenty first, and then, right. and then, you know, send out the files, and we had to be done with the film as opposed yep. to actually wanting to be done with it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly how it happened. <laughs> But so was. so beyond uh, beyond the hatbox ghost, you had of course other characters in the film that you you know you still shot on blue screen, green screen, that kind of thing. Uh, you had uh, your your lead female character gets uh you know her head ends up in the box, uh, right. <laughs> which is a a fun little fun little effect there. And then Josh, I, you know one of your own family members is uh is in the short as well. Yeah, my son played uh, the little boy ghost Joshua, and uh, he, uh, we were just super proud of him. He yeah. did a great job. Yeah, we uh, we had to we had to pay him actually uh, to to do it. We we he had wanted a <laughs> pair of binoculars for months, yeah. and we said, okay, if you if you'll do the short, you can have binoculars. So he, <laughs> he that's great. Very close to melting down throughout, you know, because we just you know you have to do multiple takes, and there was right a moment where Josh was like, do we have the shot? You know, where he's pointing, and I was like, we don't have it, like. We we got to do it again, and, and Grant's you know getting ready to cry, and we we bust out <laughs> the binoculars and we're like here they are, just one more take and they're yours, and he you know finally pushed through and got it. <laughs> right, that's that, that's excellent. And then of course uh, a life scene, you know, watching the YouTube comments is hilarious because uh, there's still even though there's credits at the end of this short, and and you know at some point you realize okay this really isn't real we're not trying to bill it as real it's it's a short film there's right. still people out there thinking oh this is so fake and here's why and this and that and i saw a comment earlier that was saying oh you guys are going to get in trouble because it looks like you're pulling somebody out of the doom buggy and and you can't do that for safety reasons and this and that and i don't think they quite realized that uh, you didn't shoot the whole thing inside the mansion i mean you made your own sort of half doom buggy right you fabricated one right yeah. right yeah, for I, I guess two or three months ago, we we I started asking a few people, hey, where could we buy or rent a, a Doom buggy? Because you know I've seen like I've seen like Mr. Toad's vehicles and things like that, but nobody has a Doom buggy. Uh, I don't know why that is, but they don't. So we spent probably a month trying to figure out how to turn like a you know a, a, a kiddie pool into a Doom buggy, and then finally we found <laughs> a production designer that was like, oh, that's easy, and so. She she went and worked for a weekend and then called us over to her house and sure enough there it was it, she took a flower pot cut it in half and then uh, spray painted it black and then put uh, paper plates on it for the speakers. <laughs> Great. As simple as that. It's always the simplest solution that works out. Definitely, yeah. but it, it works. Yeah, so no, well. and it. it it looks perfect. I mean, you're, you're, you know, the, the footage, obviously, can, you kind of bill it as being unaltered, as if they're just kind of stopping and starting the camera as you go along. And, and there are definitely some seamless edits in there where the camera's flying around and you cannot tell that, you know, one second you're looking at the attic or the ballroom or whatever, and then maybe the camera will go flying and then all of a sudden you actually cut to sort of your offsite shoot, but it all, it all blends together beautifully. Yeah, it's my bedroom. We set up a big black uh, tarp or... Uh team in my bedroom and then mm -hmm. shot uh <laughs> shot up at it and it just totally totally worked so yeah no it looks great and then so the the real amazing part about this obviously the the film itself is is fantastic and i as i said i had a very small part in it uh, not in it but you know contributing a, a little bit and sort of giving you some uh mansion fan advice along <laughs> the way uh but helpful. uh okay good i'm glad i was able to, to help a little bit um but the real Amazing part about this is watching the view count go up and up and up. It's now a Friday night that we're recording this, a couple of days after Halloween, and you just posted it Monday afternoon, so four days ago, essentially. And what's the, the view count at now? We checked just a few minutes ago. It was 153,000. Wow, that's that's <laughs> unbelievable. It's and it's it's not stopping either. I mean, it's been going up like like thirty, forty thousand a day almost. Yeah. yeah. Crazy. That's that's really impressive. It got picked up by some uh, some good websites. I said, you know, Boing Boing uh, posted it, and fir uh, first showing I saw, and, and a ton of others. Uh, it just keeps, it seems to be spreading all over. Have you been getting, you know, other than kind of the crazy YouTube people, have you been getting mostly positive comments from everybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's been really cool. A, a lot of cast members actually uh, are sending words that they love it. You know, my sister's a cast okay, member good. at Disney World, and 
apparently they all know about it. You know, my sister's like, hey, you should check out this video. And they're like, oh, we've already seen that. That You know, that was your brother. <laughs> so that's pretty That's cool. great. <laughs> and then, yeah, we've gotten some nice notes from uh, people in, uh, a couple of people in Disney corporate that, that liked it. And yeah. So it's it's cool. It's, it's had a really positive reception and, and the fans just seem to really, really enjoy yeah. it. So. Good. You know, yeah, I mean, I certainly, if I had nothing to do with it and this just came out of nowhere and I saw this, I definitely would have uh, would have eaten it up. I would have probably watched it, you know, 15 times by now. Uh, and of course, this isn't your first filmmaking effort, right? I mean, you two have been sort of doing this for a while. You moved to California with this being, you know, it's kind of your goal in life. Definitely. Yeah, we I mean, we started making films when I was eight and he was 11. Um, we made our first film was a remake of Back to the Future. And, uh, I mean, it's, it was terrible. I mean, uh, but it was, uh, you know, you got to start somewhere and then just throughout the years made short films and then went to films. I went to film school and we've just been doing it for a long time. And it's just one of those, like, I I mean, you do it, do anything so many, so long, you start to kind of get good at it. And, you know, we're really proud of where this, you know, where we've gotten to with this short, it really yeah, definitely. Well, you should be. It's it's excellent, and I hope you know. Of course, there's this notion of of uh, Guillermo del Toro is out there supposedly working on a haunted mansion movie for right. Disney. You know, it's all it's kind of like he keeps getting asked, and he's like, "Oh, I worked on a script, and I handed it to him, and I don't know what's going on, and you know all this, and you know nobody has any idea where that's going." But I, it would be awesome if you know you got an email from him one day, be like, "Hey, I liked your short. Come out and help me with the movie." <laughs> that, that would be We're available. <laughs> Exactly. Um, so, you know, now that uh, but well, before we move on to kind of the next subject, I have you on the show and I want, there's a couple other things I want to talk about here. Let's uh, sort of bring this together. You, you've set up sort of a little website as the home for this short for anybody out there who wants to see it again or wants to see more. I know you're going to put up a lot of behind the scenes stuff in the coming weeks. Uh, Missing in the is the is the website for it, right? Correct. Yeah. And you can go on there and see some some pictures uh, right now. And yeah, a few, you know, maybe in the next week or two, you'll see uh a video we've got some cool stuff to show so excellent uh, looking forward to seeing all of that so uh, <laughs> the funny part about all this is uh, you know this has been an insane week uh, of course the the terribleness of uh, of hurricane sandy turned into this super storm sandy as they've been calling it uh, hitting uh, you know the country and there's of course plenty of devastation there which is which is horrible and unfortunate and actually m- sort of made us reconsider for a brief moment should we put this out or when should we do it etc and then it goes out on monday and then tuesday comes and disney out of nowhere yeah. says hey guess what we just bought lucasfilm four yeah. billion dollars <laughs> it's, it's like what just happened <laughs> I yeah. mean, for for the hype that was going on for Missing in the Mansion was fantastic, and I'm glad it kept rolling. But I mean, to be honest, Disney buying Lucasfilm slightly bigger of a story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. a little bit. A little bit. And I, I I would have been excited other than the fact that it it totally took the focus off our movie. But yeah. <laughs> Right. So, so now, the, in addition to, uh, and we've already, you know, I've already talked about the the details of this purchase uh, earlier in the show. But uh, with you, with you on here now, you two are filmmakers. You're in Hollywood, uh, of course. I'm sure you're Star Wars fans, as am I. And you know, we've got six Star Wars movies already. So Disney not only purchases Lucasfilm and everything associated with it, but also says, guess what? We're making three more Star Wars movies. What's your take on that? I'm really excited about it. I think it, it, I feel like George Lucas has been kind of over it for a long time now. Yeah. And I think this frees it up to get in the hands of some people that are going to be really excited yeah. and people that grew up with it and right, love it. Right. Fresh ideas and, you know, it isn't just a big cash grab. And the fact right. that. Yeah. Always talked about a seven and eight, seven, eight, nine. That's always been in the in the mythology of it. You know, it's right. not like just pulling this out of nowhere. I mean, it, you know, we've always heard rumors of a of potential story ideas he's had for seven, eight, nine. So, right, I say let's do it. <laughs> and, and the chance to go back and and revisit the characters that we love from the originals. Yeah, it, right. I mean, I mean, we don't know if they're going to be in anything, but 
you know, there's always that chance that, you know, Mark yeah. Hamill can come back. Is it? Yeah. Well, I mean, if, if Harrison Ford can become Indiana Jones for number four, even yeah. though most people hated that movie, uh, that aside, I'm sure he could come back at least for, right. you know, a couple of minutes and be like, hey, I'm Han Solo. Here I am still and yep. yeah. give me my paycheck. Exactly. <laughs> Very true. So, yeah, no, I, I I agree as well. And I think, of course, the other side that everybody's really excited about to not only, uh, you know, having three more movies and, you know, Star Wars sort of integrated across Disney's TV and merchandising and all of that, but the possibility of the theme parks. And that's not exactly a foreign topic. I mean, Star Wars Weekend, Star Tours, you know, Jedi Training Academy, it's been going on for years. Um, but do you think this is going to sort of push that to the next level is that sort of mysterious star wars land that's been rumored for a while you know is that do you think that's going to happen i hope so man yeah, just, <laughs> just the possibilities just uh, yeah I, well it, what would you like to see in a, in a star wars land what would if you had one sort of step into the world of star wars what would it be man i mean Wow, there's um, just so much you could do. I mean, Hoth would be fun. Hoth would be amazing. The I, you know, the ice caves and all of that. And uh, yeah, you know what's really funny about that is, of course, SeaWorld is working on their Antarctica uh, realm out here, and the Empire of the Penguin attraction. They've been billing it as the coldest theme park attraction on the planet. Imagine Disney kind of swooping in and said, "Uh, uh-uh, you know, we have Hoth." Yeah. <laughs> <That'd be cool. laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, of course, you know, rumors have pointed to it just specifically in Hollywood studios. And these have been rumors for years uh, that, you know, the backlot uh, eatery would become maybe the Star Wars cantina or the former Sounds Dangerous location could be like a Dagobah Yoda interactive sort of force meet and greet. And, you know, just as you said, the possibilities just go on and on. Yeah. And, it, you know, it, it shows you uh, I mean, there's just a stark difference between the potential of Avatar land versus Right. Star Wars land, you know, it's just it's, it's night and day, really. It's like what one we're clamoring for, and the other, um, okay, I guess that could be interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What's really funny is I had talked about the the quote unquote leaked Avatar plans from I don't know a week or two ago, and the timing of that related to Star Wars announcement, Lucasfilm announcement this week seems a little suspicious. You know, it's almost like Disney was like, hey, let's put this out there real quick, see what the reaction is, and then we're going to do this other announcement, and whichever one is the huge, you know, hit, we're going to go in that direction. Right. Well, that's a no-brainer, really. I mean, come on. (laughs) Yeah, I remember when Avatar was first announced, the first reaction from so many people was like, can we have Star Wars instead? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I have to think that everyone at Imagineering is just beside themselves at the possibilities yeah yeah it's so cool. so so you know I, I said star wars has been in the parks already in some capacity for a long time it's easy to make that leap to thinking there's going to be more of it on the same lines now we jump two days later so first we have missing in the mansion on monday star wars slash lucasfilm on tuesday two days later last night as i said we're recording this on friday over at universal orlando their not so secret announcement of the transformers ride now coming here to Orlando. Uh, both of you have been on Transformers out in Hollywood, right? At Universal? Right. Yeah. So, and I have as well. I was there at the grand opening in May. I talked about all about it on the show, and, you know, I'm not going to sort of rehash all those details here, but, uh, you know, from uh, sort of your perspective as filmmakers, what do you make of Star Wars, you know, the possibilities and, and that whole world versus something like Transformers and this 3D environment that they've created? You know, where does that, that balance sort of sit? Ooh, interesting hmm. that's a good question because i yeah. mean that's really the competitions going on you mentioned avatar you know you got transformers and then of course there's harry potter it's this whole right. crazy world of intellectual property going out there between disney and universal it's you know where where is the back and forth when you know let's say they build star wars land out here and then universal builds harry potter part two and transformers i mean do you go to yeah. do you just have to go to both i mean how can you skip all of that you know it's any of that crazy. i mean It's a crazy amount of escalation, really, that it's like, I mean, you pull out something as amazing as as Harry Potter and you, I mean, it's, it is a fun sort of, I mean, it's a great, it's a great thing for us as fans because they're raising the bar each time, you know, that's awesome. I mean, I, I really hope with, you know, whatever they do for Star Wars, it is more uh, sort of an immersive type of thing like, um, like, like Harry Potter versus, you know. Uh, as much as I like Transformers and it's an amazing ride, it, it is it is just a ride. It's not like right. transferring you into a world, you know. Um, but yeah, I would. I, I think they're different experiences for sure. 
Yeah. Uh, well, the speed at which they're building Transformers says a lot. I mean, it's Universal clearly saying we have all this money from Potter. We want to use it. Transformers is popular. Everybody loves it. Let's just do it. You know, we've already built it twice before. Singapore, Hollywood, eh, well, you know, less yeah. than a year. Just crank yeah. it out. There it is. All right. It so, is uh, so, yeah, no, it is. It is. It is definitely a cool ride. And I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, but uh, so there it is. You know, it's certainly theme park excitement, Hollywood related, film related and uh, tying it all together here. Your own film project that kind of inspired by the parks makes its way to uh, to the Internet and, and short films. Uh, you know, where do you go from here? Is it just kind of basking in the glory of the success of Missing in the Mansion? Uh, is there Missing in, you know, the Mansion 2 on the horizon? Or are you just kind of like, whoa, I need to take a break? Terrified in the teacups. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we thought about doing the Tower of Terror, but we're both too afraid to ride that ride. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a difficult shoot, I must say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, all right, well, good ideas, so we'll see. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sure. I'm sure you all you all have ideas. Well, you know, good luck uh, certainly with this project. I, I certainly will keep watching the view counts climb. Everyone out there, if, even if you've already watched, to go watch it again. There's yes. so much uh, that that you two poured into it as far as uh, you know the visual effects. There are some some real subtleties in there that you may have missed if you only watched it once. You know, blow it up full screen, put it on a TV, put it on a projector. You know, whatever you have to do. Uh, uh, it, it's definitely a lot to see in there and it's um, i'm so happy to see it uh, be as as successful it has been yeah listen with headphones the sound design is really really good yeah yeah and it's very creepy <laughs> <laughs> well good that you know that that was exactly the point give a little extra scare to the mansion which uh, i'm certainly all for so uh the Dawes Brothers, thanks for uh, for chatting about it. Uh, everybody out there, once again, missinginthemansion.com is where you're going to want to go to uh, check out that short. Uh, of course, uh, we've got some more information over on insidethemagic.net. And then you've got your own uh, website as well, separate, uh, just dawesbrothers.com. That's correct. Yeah. Right. Right. Yep. Yep. Excellent. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, what are your Twitter handles? Uh, Jeremiah Dawes, no space, and Josh, Josh. Dawes. Simple as that. Uh, fantastic. Uh, so I, I'm sure we'll we'll hear from you guys again. Uh, you know, we're always talking Disney stuff anyway, and uh, sure. whatever the next big thing is at Disneyland, uh, we'll be there. So thanks for uh, for chatting on the show this week. Well, thanks, thanks for having us. And before we jump into this week's listener feedback at the end of a rather long show, I do want to put in a quick word about Lanyard Lab. If you've got a business to promote or maybe a uh, convention you are attending or a school or a church where you need to wear name tags around your neck, uh, head on over to lanyardlab.com where you can customize your own lanyards. Just click uh, wherever it says get a quote and fill out our uh, quote request form. Fill in all your details there, submit it uh, to us, and we'll email you back with a price quote along with a proof showing you what your lanyards will look like from there you can purchase online if you're happy with anything or of course we'll make any changes that you need it is all free to preview uh, no obligation whatsoever to purchase and uh, check it out over at lanyardlab.com that's l-a-n-y-a-r-d-l-a-b.com hey ricky hi ricky hi ricky hey ricky hi ricky hey ricky hey, ricky this is amazing Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Inside the Magic Listener Feedback. So it has been a rather long show with some big news this week and a lot of things to talk about. So we'll just do a few listener feedback emails here. Uh, before we do that, of course, we were talking about Star Wars at the beginning of the show, and I totally forgot that I had a prop next to me that I was going to pick up and use during that segment, and there was just so much to talk about that I forgot to, so... Now I'm going to pick it up, and here we go. Yeah, I'm holding a lightsaber. Isn't that awesome? Here, you can hear it. Okay, anyway, uh, moving on with the uh, the listener feedback. Uh, these are sort of piggybacking on the Halloween uh, topic here. Ollie wrote in and said, on this week's show, you had a listener ask about the Halloween version of Small World. I'm not sure if you've seen or heard of it, but there's a knockoff version of uh, It's a Small World in China that might fit this criteria. Here's a link to uh, YouTube or just look up Chinese Small World. Ollie, yes, I have seen that, and it is creepy as anything. You're right. That is essentially the Halloween version of It's a Small World. Uh, if anyone has not looked up this uh, this bizarre um, sort of knockoff version of its small world in this other theme park uh, that's a wannabe Disney park in China, definitely go check that out. It is creepy. 
Uh, so along the same lines, John wrote in and said, uh, first up, great job to uh, you and the rest of the crew of the Missing in the Mansion video. Kudos to everyone involved. You had mentioned on your Halloween show that you'd like to hear the names of Halloween-themed Disney attractions. I came up with a few possibilities. Uh, some of the ones I came up with were Pirates of the Scarabian, or alternatively, uh, the Scarousel of Progress, uh, Mickey's Phil Horror Magic, the Many Adventures of Winnie the Boo, Peter Pan's Fright, or Ariel's Under Scream Adventure. <laughs> so, uh, or if you're visiting Disneyland, you have to check out Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln Vampire Hunter or the Splatterhorn. John, I love those. I love each and every one of those. Uh, Pirates of the Scarabian, interestingly enough, was a concept that was kind of floated around at one point to make a Halloween scary version of Pirates uh, of the Caribbean, obviously. Uh, so that one is not even uh, that far-fetched. It was considered uh, somewhere in the the the. De the depths of Imagineering, but the rest of those are fantastic. I would be more than happy to, to go see great moments with Mr. Lincoln Vampire Hunter. Uh, I can only imagine what the splatter horn would be either. <laughs> All right, moving on from there, Kim wrote in and said, my brother and I are huge fans and we listen every week. And uh, she basically wanted me to give a birthday shout out to her brother, which I will be happy to do. His name is Easton. So Easton, happy birthday. Thanks very much for uh, listening to, uh, to Inside the Magic so regularly. <laughs> Next, Chris Ann, a DVC member from New Jersey, writes in and says, I'm a longtime listener of your show, and I love it. In August of 2013, we'll be staying at the Beach Club with my husband and six-year-old daughter. We are vacationing with another couple and their daughter, and we'll be taking turns watching each other's children so that we can have an adult night out. So my question is, what are your top three restaurants for an adult night out? My husband and I enjoy great food and great atmosphere. Any suggestions would be greatly appreciated. Well, Chris Ann, uh, great idea. Uh, adult nights out are very important uh, to get away from the kids and uh, certainly if you're looking for a truly adults only night out you know really the only option you're going to find is uh, that rather uh, pricey uh, high class high scale restaurant Victorian Alberts over at the Grand Floridian because they don't allow children in there of course uh, it is it is rather expensive uh, it's a you know very elaborate uh, occasion so you might not want to be going quite that far just uh, outside there as I mentioned a few weeks ago I ate at uh, Citricos for the first time which was uh, absolutely delicious very few kids in there. Uh, still a Grand Floridian style. You know, you feel like you need to dress up just a little bit. You don't have to, but you feel like you should when you go there. And the food was absolutely delicious. Um, you know, I, I don't... Uh, you know, thinking about other other places for adults to uh, to go. It just depends on what you are looking for specifically as far as, uh, you know, are you looking to get away from the kids or are you just looking for a good time for two adults to go and, as you said, have great food and a great atmosphere? Uh, you know, every time anybody ever asks what restaurant do I recommend at Walt Disney World, my answer is always Boma because I love it there. However, it is a little hectic. It is a buffet. It is, uh, you know, definitely a lot of kids there as well. So I don't know if that's necessarily the direction that uh, you want to go. Generally, uh, probably Probably a table service uh, option would be what you are uh, are looking for. Um, so I don't know that I just mentioned a top three, but I, I did mention a, a few that uh, come to mind immediately for uh, my recommendations. Certainly, uh, a lot of the restaurants around uh, World Showcase, Le Cellier is a great place to go because it's kind of dark and you can you know sit over in a corner and away from everybody and enjoy some really excellent food. That's of course in uh, Canada at Epcot. Definitely one of my favorites there. And uh, I don't know, I could just go on. There, there are so many. You know, really just focus in on the uh, on the table service locations. Um, and I think you'd be you'd be pretty good to go. <laughs> and I'm just watching the chat room here as I'm recording this, and uh, a few more ideas for uh, for Halloween uh, attractions. Uh, let's see, Mr. Giovanniello is suggesting the Deadway People Mover or the Enchanted Freaky Room. <laughs> these are these are fantastic. Uh, somebody needs to make all of these happen. All right, let's go over to a voice message. Hey, Ricky. This is Noah from Pennsylvania, and I just, I don't really have a question or something, but honestly, I just wanted to say how much I enjoy your podcast and your website. Um, I live in Pennsylvania, so I don't, I get down to um, Walt Disney World about once a year, and um, specifically just now, I was just looking over the um, soft opening of New Fantasyland, and I was like freaking out, and it's so great to see that you're always able to keep people like me informed, and I appreciate it so much. And 
basically when I have some minute of free time in my life, I sit down and watch your podcast, and I'm, as I'm sure many others do. And so, yeah, I just wanted to say how thankful I am, and I'm sure all of your fans are, with your basically up-to-the-minute <laughs> updates about the park the new movies and everything. So I just wanted to say thank you again. I'm looking at New Fantasy Land, your post on New Fantasy Land as we speak, and I just wanted to say thank you so much, and I will be watching your podcast again this coming week. Thank you very much. Bye, Ricky. You are most very, very welcome, uh, Noah, and everybody else who uh, feels the same way. I'm more than happy to do all of it. Of course, it's a blast for me. I mean, I'm running out to the theme parks all the time and, you know, taking pictures and video of stuff along the way, of course, but uh, but having a fun because it's rides and it's it's eating and it's it's characters and all the good stuff that is Disney, so I'm happy to uh, to bring it all to you. So I'm glad there's many of you out there who are enjoying it, uh, either through the show or uh, through the website uh, and or through the website. Next, email from David, uh, who writes in in response to Chris Ann's uh, question about restaurants from last week. Uh, that's interesting. I just read Chris Ann. Hmm, I wonder if I read that email twice here. Well, if I did, then that is a rapid response from people. So David writes, I highly recommend Raglan Road at Downtown Disney. It's located just past the bridge to Pleasure Island. There are uh, kids there, but it's definitely uh, geared more towards adults. However, it is uh, not a quiet restaurant, being an Irish pub theme. There's definitely a lot of noise going on between the live music and the river dancing, and uh, the food is great, especially the bread. It's delicious soda bread uh, uh, with an uh, oil and Guinness reduction uh, dipping sauce. I'm ranting now, but uh, I do highly recommend it. It's fun atmosphere and delicious food. Uh, David, you're absolutely right. I had dinner at Raglan Road just a few weeks ago and was absolutely delicious from that bread at the beginning all the way through everything that I ate. In fact, there was so much food, I took some home, had it the next day, and it was still uh, just as good. It was uh, it was wonderful. So good suggestion, and uh, and clearly I had already read uh, Chris Ann's email on the show, so now I've read it twice and uh, already have a response from somebody else. That is some fast timing there. Uh, yeah, so moving on. Matthew writes, uh, just wanted to start off by saying thanks for always keeping uh, Disney and theme park fans across the country informed. Uh, this New Year's uh, Eve, my girlfriend and I will be spending our time at the Magic Kingdom as expected, dining at Cinderella's Castle, and be our guests are booked. The rest of the dining options are available for our preferred time at 7 o'clock, but we are stuck on deciding which one to eat at. I'm guessing you've been asked this question plenty of times, but with the two most popular dining options booked, which would you prefer for our New Year's Eve dinner? Matthew, that is a tough question because, honestly, Honestly, I'm not a fan of much to eat in the Magic Kingdom. Be Our Guest sounds like it's going to be delicious, and maybe you can squeeze in there, um, you know, only being two of you, uh, perhaps for dinner, maybe just for lunch, uh, you know, be there right when they open for lunch service, and maybe you can find your way in, at least enjoy it that way. The rest of the park, eh, you know, the food is not spectacular. I'm not sure I can uh, specifically recommend something within that park to have a glorious New Year's Eve dinner. I, I would count on more just having something quick to eat. Enjoy more rides as much as you can when there's long, long waits for New Year's Eve and then uh, ultimately just, you know, grab some some ice cream or some goodies from the Main Street Bakery or something like that and make that your, uh, your treat for the evening. <laughs> And uh, all right, we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up right there. I do have a lot more listener feedback to get to, and now with Halloween season kind of uh, well, it is concluded, and uh, Christmas season not quite here just yet. Although I do have uh, plenty to talk about uh, with regards to that, and many other topics in the coming weeks. Uh, point being, I'm gonna have some time to finally catch up on uh, listener feedback here, with a little bit less to uh, discuss uh, week to week. So. I will plan on doing that very soon, but for now, that'll do it for listener feedback this week. There's a great big beautiful tomorrow. And this is where we wrap up show 396 of Inside the Magic. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed the uh, huge huge announcements that came out this week. Uh, certainly Disney buying Lucasfilm. That came out of nowhere. When I saw that uh, sort of come across my my news feeds, I had to do a triple take and think, is it April 1st? That was just such a surprise. Uh, but then, of course, it kept developing, and it was clear that it was uh, in D23, 
indeed real and uh, just an incredible amount of news. Uh, we'll see where that leads as far as Star Wars and everything else goes uh, in the uh, in the coming years. Should be very very exciting, and I'm really looking forward to Transformers as well. That was not a surprise. Uh, everybody kind of knew that was coming. It was uh, the worst kept secret uh, around, unlike uh, unlike Star Wars. Uh, but uh, I am excited. Transformers is a fun ride, and I, I'm really excited to have that uh, out here in Orlando as well. And uh, those of you uh, who have not, uh, hopefully, if you've listened to this far in the show or if you've watched this far in the show, you have already seen Missing in the Mansion, the uh, short film that the Dawes Brothers put together that I had a small part in uh, in helping with as well. If you haven't somehow seen it yet, uh, go check it out, missinginthemansion.com, or uh, read more about it over at InsideTheMagic.net. It is uh, such a fun little film uh, for, uh, not, I shouldn't even say little, it is a fun short film uh, that uh, required a lot of work and a lot of planning and a lot of uh, effort uh, to create uh, and definitely go uh, go check it out over at, uh, again, missinginthemansion.com. So I do want to thank Magical Travel for sponsoring this week's episode of Inside the Magic. You can find out more about their services by visiting magicaltravel.com. Uh, also, uh, visit us over at lanyardlab.com to see all the different styles of custom lanyard options that we have available. You can request a price quote today to receive a free digital preview of your lanyard design. And uh, there's that game, Just Dance Disney Party, that is available now for uh, Connect for 360 and Nintendo Wii at your local retailer, so go check that out as well. And of course, visit our website over at InsideTheMagic.net. It is your source for Disney and theme park news between episodes of this show. You can find us on uh, Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and all that good stuff to stay on top of it throughout uh, every week. So thanks again to all of you for listening and for watching each and every week. And uh, have a magical week. Bye. There's a great big beautiful tomorrow Just a dream away